Welcome to the August 3rd Open ZFS Production Users Call. We have Andrew, Alexander, Jan, and myself, Michael. We're expecting others to trickle in. One topic that came up is that Alexander has a usually has a conflict with this time slot, and there are at least two people in uh, Asia and Australia and Oceania who are having conflict. So uh, let's maybe think about Wednesday afternoon as a later slot. Thursdays are busy for me, unfortunately. Um, I do have a proposed topic on open CFS data quiescing with different applications such as databases and virtual machines and containers, but that can wait. Uh, Andrew, uh, let's see, Alexander Moten was giving us an update on his work that he hopes to get into. I think would, it, would that make it into 2.3 or 2.4? He has an open review for Zill improvements. There is a link in the doc and uh, we can, after that, talk about the features for FreeBSD 14 release. So Alexander, I understand you have a, an, a, a set of Zill improvements that uh, improve the threading because there's already a lot competition per data set. Yes. Go ahead and describe Yes, that. correct. Uh, there was slow contention in Zill for many years. Practically, there was a single per data set lock and uh, that all the uh, log structure was filled, all you know, like log block data were filled while holding that log, which means that if we are having a log, a log uh, in a pool, then uh, it is limited by memory copy throughput of single CPU, which may be not as high as we'd like. That creates so while one while one thread copies the data, all others are sitting and waiting, doing waiting for that logs burning CPU. Uh, I have one version of uh, fix for that already merged into 2.2, but there was found some deadlocks in some particular uh, workloads. So I mentioned that uh, PR15122, that should fix the issue and make it even more parallel. So right now, uh, like as, as illustration, I was doing uh, VMware vMotion to iSCSI the, the wall and uh, VMotion tend to use 64 kilobyte blocks, 64 kilobyte writes, but it sends a few dozen of them same time. And I noticed that with my improvements, it increases write throughput from like 2, 2, 2.1 gigabytes per second to three and a half. And after that, I'm not sure it's it's a NAS bandwidth limitation. It's probably limitation of VMware or the place I'm copying from. So uh, it should be pretty good change for those who need parallel writes. I just need somebody to, well, more people to test it and review. George Wilson was promising to test it since uh, he, he was, he actually found the deadlock, but more people are welcome. Understood. On, the on the top of master, but it should apply the same on, on top of 2.2. RC3 or whatever it is now. So I'd, I'd like to merge that into, into 2.2, just not sure at which point since it's already in RC3, but the logs are not good anyway. So I think it's... And did you um, say that got you up to 3.5 gigabits, gigabits per second? Yeah, on my test, I'm getting about 3.5 gigabytes per second, but again, maybe it could be more. It's not not anymore limited by the NAS. Okay, Before my and push, was that NFS or iSCSI? It was ice crazy. Okay, thank you. Before my patch, it was definitely CPU bottleneck. There was huge lock contention and burned insane amount of CPU on that lock. After that, lock is still there. There's some small contention remains because as any global lock, but it's not no longer anywhere that bad. So, right, yeah. so the lock is per data set in the pool, not per VDEV? Per data set. Or is there also a lock on the S lock? It's lock on a on, no on a Zill. Just in case of S lock, it's it's worse because uh, in, uh, in case of S lock, all data are copied. It's double copy. Yeah, they they copied into uh, Zill blocks. That makes it worse. But even without uh, like issuing the IOs while holding the lock, also were not easy. And I fixed that too. 
So it should improve both S log and non-S log cases, but probably S log some more. Okay, well that uh, we will bring attention this to meeting as we can. Welcome, John D. <clears throat> and John uh, Alexander just gave us an overview of some work he has to improve Zill and slug performance relating to a, a lock. If you and yours have any capacity to test that, that would be excellent. And if you have any topics to share, we have a few on the doc, but this is your call. So I've proposed one and it looks like Jan, you proposed the patching nesting tree or is that you, Andrew? That was me. That was you. So John, do you have any topics or shall we just plow on? Uh, no, uh, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, you may plow forward. Um, I am reading what you wrote there. Um, I might be able to do a test um, later, possibly next week. Um, and I don't have any specific topics. I was here to play fly on the wall. And uh, uh, please go have, have, have at it. Okay, thank you, thank you. And uh, Alexander, on that same topic about 14.0 uh, release, are they currently at 2.2 .2 or 2.1 even? Uh, 13 is now, uh, well, it's, it's now on, uh, like 13 is on 2.1, 14 is on 2.2, and after branching, uh, master should go 2.3. The question is now we are not yet at branch point, so we are a bit uh, stuck in a weird situation while we are not exactly following either science. ZFS already branched, FreeBSD is not. Like if we try to follow one branch, that we may have to revert some commits and reapply. I guess that's why Martin is not merging latest RC changes, even so there are some we should definitely have. Got it. So somebody should ask him what's the plan because we obviously should merge some patches that are there. They are important. these tracked somewhere? For example, uh, in the FreeBSD bug tracker as a meta uh, bug collecting the blockers? Or the OpenCFS leadership docs? Uh, I'm not sure whether it was uh, documented anywhere. It, it was discussed and uh, that definitely was, I think it was presented at some point and uh, announced by Martin. This that was agreed that uh, 14 release should go with ZFS 2.2 and next should go 2.3. It just, I don't know exactly how, when and how Martin gonna do the merges. So I can only speculate on that. Okay. Anything so else on that any topic? Known, go ahead. Uh, outstanding, uh, changes on f to be committed to 14 uh, should probably be added as a dependency to this uh, bug entry. I just dropped it in chat. So there's a FreeBSD 14 uh, meta bug okay. tracked by Mark Johnson. Is. We've got and... three authors. I don't see Martin, but okay. Uh, Good to know. Mark Johnston is other as report. Is that okay. Martin Matruska? Mark who's J, doing I think, the is that. Imports or Mark J? Yeah. Um, Martin Matruska. Okay, got it. Uh, I'll just add this as a note. Okay, uh, Jan, let's segue into your patching nested trees. What is it you want to yes. achieve with that? Okay. Um... This came up in the jails call and out of the what can a jail manager do, what can be done through jail.conf in FreeBSD 13 already, just through creative slash too clever use of uh, the hooking mechanisms in the jail command. Okay. And I proved that it's at least possible to, if you want to run immutable data sets, use... Um, ZFS snapshots and then read only clones of those snapshots, especially for your base system uh, packages and other modifications, the immutable part, and have uh, stateful uh, writable data sets intermingled in your ZFS data set subtree. And uh, then have 
updates preserving the um, writable parts, but re replacing the deduplicated by replication, snapshotting, and cloning immutable parts. So that you can have the container workflow without either uh, nullfs or unionfs or other virtual file system magic just through um, meticulous use of zfs commands and still get the workflow uh, expected of such a tool so but it requires it... doing updates because you will have a read only mounted clone of a snapshot with modified child data sets so you have to basically move it out of the way and recreate the it and then rename the right child data sets uh, and basically reorganize the tree by so that the inheritance is correct again and that's all possible, but a bit fragile and error prone to do uh, in shell, in a hook somewhere. And I was wondering if anyone else had this kind of problem and if there is a good, let's say, well-tested shell script, Python script, uh, something module to basically do this kind of replace, the, keep these subtrees, but replace these other nodes in the tree. Do they get unmounted on you? When you update the parent, you have to stop the jail so that you, because you're, unless you're, you can do it if you, uh, you can do it if the updated one gets a new mount point. Let's say you just issue a UUID for the new updated one. If that, but if you want to have the updated jail uh, use the same mount point, you have to first change the mount point temporarily uh, to move it out of the way and make the mount, mount point available. So okay. either you have to have a little bit of downtime or the new one has to come into existence somewhere else. So it can't be reused on the fly. Is that possibly mm. a limitation of ZFS? Not really. It's a limitation of anything Unix-like. Okay, fair enough. Uh, unless you have a very special kind of VFS, which can basically, yeah, atomically switch the overlay and union in, in a single step, which, and then the question is, what are you doing? Because if the jail is running, that means that you're still running the old uh, read-only mapped executables and libraries. So it's really defeating the purpose of updating the system of having no, no downtime because you're supposed to replace the immutable parts and make use of the new ones. And unless you have something very special like HA proxy, which has a zero downtime update mechanism using fork, exec, and file descriptor passing, uh, this is just uh, not. Okay, so currently you have to you shut know. down the let's say, jail, application that happens shut, to be a jail. But the downtime can be yep. sub second. Okay. Um, in practice, what do you think gets you closer to the behavior you want? So you do get that dynamic uh, what reset, or are you saying uh, move from shell to Lua, a, or what? F -Lua. Would be a command uh, basically to specify what to keep and what to replace, and the right snapshots, and then have it do it in a reliable fashion, the right order, <clears throat> however you uh, intermingle the um, recursively. So it's a bit of, yeah, enumerate the tree, find the right order, which can be done through just topological sorting. But it's it's just annoying to do. And I wondered if anyone has already solved this. Because I haven't found any gen basically factored out solution. And the jail managers kind of punt at this point and force the user to cobble something together every time. Andrew, do zones do anything special in such situations, to your knowledge? Um, I've not messed with really immutable data sets and zones much, like he's talking about. 
So I don't know. Usually I'm just taking a clone of something anyway. Fair enough. And it's and it's just it, it's not immutable. It's a uh, it's a writable clone. And is it and usually that, one data set depth deep? Uh no. Okay. Usually you usually I have um I want to say two or three data sets deep when I'm doing that. Mhm. Mm cuz I cuz um I've I have I do have a script that I've set up and it it goes through and it converts the home directories to be a ZFS file system and then each user underneath that gets their own file system as well. Uh, the trick there was it had to home had to be since it was always full path root home home had to be mounted within it as a as uh, as being under slash so it needed to have its uh, mount point changed which is fine it works Alexander, do any ideas come to mind based on your extensive experience? I haven't, I don't work so much with the file level. The only place where we touched it was on uh, Linux when in containers, we have to make ZFS actually work with NullFS, but it was again, it was NullFS, it wasn't um, native cloning or things. So, the problem is that the jail.conf doing all of this is uh, slowly gaining a conscience and is snarling back at me. So I have to factor this out of the jail configuration file because it's basically just a crime looking uh, like a jail.conf. And John, do you have any ideas, no matter how wild? Um, no, I don't. Um, my, to respond to one of the prior, uh, uh, comments, uh, my snapshot depth is usually somewhere between, uh, five and seven. And my problem is, is similar, but different. The, I actually hand out sets of VMs, which are typically running Linux, which then have Kubernetes running and all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. And as each group gets their hands on it, they run uh, a, another level of configuration, which then gets snapshotted. The, yep. opposed, the opposing issue here that I'm having to deal with is the security group doesn't like having snapshots of code available that are not uh, fixed, so to speak. <laughs> Yeah, uh huh. Laugh all you want. Um, yeah, I kind of see their point, and at the same time, I see the futility. So when the when you when you roll back the system to then reapply all the updates that they have for their code, we then reopen ourselves to a a CVE, and trying to get CVEs put into the official process is uh, it amusing. It is is interesting. Let me phrase it that way. Um, so I, I am, I feel like I'm dealing with a similar situation, but different. Yeah. You get into similar problems. If some intermediate snapshot in your backup, has uh, violated some kind of a non-disclosure agreement or, uh, is subject to some kind of deletion request or stuff like this. Uh, and then yes. suddenly you're facing the problem well it's all hash linked i can't <laughs> yeah so i'm i'm slowly moving to the point where i have to actually just purge these things and recreate them dynamically very very quickly which is yet another um it, it's just yet another requirement slash way of doing it to meet requirements um wasn't there some kind of file level uh, user control deduplication work ongoing uh, PJD's work? I think so. Uh, uh, block general, cloning, was it? Yeah, exactly, block cloning. Uh, uh, without help or hurt? <laughs> that would uh, help a lot for the container 
Style Rock user instead of doing basically the deduplication either uh, through immutability and uh, snapshotting and cloning where you have to keep it immutable because otherwise you can't rebase clones and the fix for this is to uh, completely follow the immutable or at least non uh, volatile uh, oh sorry volatile storage and whether basically the clones can be discarded by updates because either they're immutable or at least their state does not need to be preserved um but the other alternative um which is very painful in production because you can dig an ever deeper hole is to use uh, ZFS deduplication with all of its downsides, which basically gets you the storage efficiency of a deduplicated system, but uh, a lot of overhead. And block level deduplication under, or would uh, or block cloning or whatever it was called um, fixes this kind because you don't have to go through the full DDT and especially not for every block reference but only uh, for the deduplicated ones and the entries are smaller and you explicitly create them instead of burdening every block with uh, going through deduplication. So with some irony we've done manual human based deduplication but then it's bitten us and the mechanical one might actually be better because i've long advocated for knowing your golden mass your golden image and cloning that okay you have an example what you got um that's the uh, script that we that i use for that um it actually is designed to work at both um um the global zone and uh, the guest zone because it behaves differently. But if you take the guest zone path, um, it deals with uh, that particular sad I'm thing. Doing right now is so that my jail sh checks if the the origin of its clone is the right snapshot. If it isn't, uh, it f renames the existing root data set of the jail to a temporary one, just basically taking the last uh, element of the dataset name and prefixing it with a dot to have a temporary name. Uh, and then uh, I create the, the structure with all the ones which are out of sync, take the ones which are in sync and the mutable ones basically every subnode gets recreated either by renaming it back into place or uh, by uh, cloning the new snapshot read-only. Jan, have you scripted that? Do you have code you can also drop in? Um, yes, I have okay. code snippets, but they don't make a lot of sense without 500 lines of context. Understood. OK, well, I hope I this helps you having brought that up. In Actually, let me repost that with the comment that goes sure. with it. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, it's, now it's too long. Basically, it would be a okay. <clears throat> series of blog articles. <laughs> Did this spur any other ideas or questions relating to this? Thank you, Andrew, for that. Because I have a topic, but I'd like to hear others from you. Okay, so I'll go and I am happy just planting the seed and nothing more at this stage. But uh, over the years, I have seen various documents on, say, hosting uh, PostgreSQL on ZFS. And there are almost competing a piece of pieces of advice such as separate out your wall, the write ahead logging. But Jan pointed out that if all of your Postgres components are the same data set, then any snapshot should truly be atomic and capture anything and not need any kind of like 
stop the database, etc. So I would love to, with the goal of this being in the official documentation, not hiding in a blog post, not hiding in this doc, but just to go through different types of applications, be it Postgres, be it MySQL, be it containers, mm -hmm. as, we, as we've touched on, I threw in Domino, uh, you name it. I'd love to just slowly paint this picture of what these different quiescing steps so, are. Go ahead. Regarding uh, PostgreSQL, yes. the usage is that, if I remember correctly, for the actual table spaces. 8K. Uh, 8K. Okay. At least that's the block size. But I don't know if you can change, but that's what just a uh, uh, common recommendation for the white ahead log files is 128K, anything much larger doesn't give you much more throughput and it increases latency uh, proportional at least to the right size. So if you mm -hmm. have ex example 16 megabyte, then you have just increased your commit time, which often hurts a lot more than any potential throughput improvement uh, on a SQL database. Uh, depending on what you're using Postgres for, there can be an argument for instead of matching the record size of your data set to uh, your Postgres block size for the BTree, uh, to have a much larger record size, let's say 128K, sometimes even larger up to a megabyte uh, with uh, LZ4 compression, because the, the database, especially the indices are so well compressible that you can easily uh, increase your resident uh, working set by a factor of four or five for realistic use cases and basically fit that much more into your uh, main memory instead of your slightly faster file system, which okay. oftentimes can be the difference between fitting your whole working set into compressed main memory or putting it on affordable SSDs which, um, yeah, just for a bit little, or for a little bit more memory on the system instead of bigger and faster SSDs, and the payoff is immense if you can fit your database indices completely into main memory. Fair enough, but that's a performance question rather than a data a integrity question. Performance question, but it's relevant how you lay out your pool because this is all about laying out your pool. Very for the true. And. Have you? And it sounds like you're running Postgres more or less in production on ZFS, correct? I am, but and... not under high load. I have helped others tune their systems. Okay. And this is the case where I found out that a friend of mine running this in anger suddenly found out that his uh, annoying uh, Dell server with a controller which couldn't be put in IT mode because uh, there is no IT firmware for this card and so on. Mm -hmm. So he was suffering uh. these IOPS limitations, uh, which is why it was even worse for him because he did buy data center grade SATA SSDs for his database, but it didn't help because he was limited by the RAID engine of his memory, uh, of his storage controller. Okay, well, a little off topic, but, yeah, but uh, it's so a this is a pain for ZFS users. Correct. So you've taken these configuration um, we tried points. It. Okay. We tried it on his and found out that um, in his case, he uh, used a synchronous application anyway as a backup mechanism. So he used uh, Postgres followers consuming the wire files. Okay. So it made more sense to have two data sets and have the write ahead log on uh, a larger record size and we have a, so that you can split it up, but you lose the nice property that a snapshot, as long as you use one data set, which is good enough for most cases, especially now that we can have uh, not just uh, the S log, which has basically been always there, for the production lifetime of ZFS, but we can also use a special allocation class to keep the small blocks on a different uh, VDEF until the VDEF overflows, and then it falls back gracefully to the next best uh, VDEF. So that can be used to keep uh, the small blocks um, on uh, 
for example, local NVMe flash. Yep, yep, yep. yep. Then... Do I understand you're using Postgres repl replication rather than snapshotting in your situation? Uh, not my situation, His but situation. he used it. Okay, so no snapshotting so, at all? No, not on, snapshotting on a backup system which used a single data set. Okay. Uh, then does anyone else have experiences with, in this case, Postgres? I... Be run it performance in a similar configuration yep. with just one data set. I found that the right amplification, because my uh, workload isn't right heavy, uh, doesn't matter. And just having a 128K record size on a mirrored pool with LZ4 is worth it because I get a de deduplication factor of around, around four. Uh, using... Uh, Internal to Postgres or OpenZFS no, deduplication? Don't use uh, Postgres level buffer uh, compression. That is disabled the GCIP uh, compression inside Postgres because that's quite slow. Instead, I rely on the um, ZFS LZ4 compression. Okay. Which it's just that no, no matter how well Postgres implements a GCIP stays gzip so or deflate and i have a link to the official wiki which touches on some of this but and not if you in just depth, but... snapshot uh, i think pgcon last year had a good uh, talk about postgres and zfs matching up uh 2022 i think 2022 okay thank you uh there was a talk about running Postgres and how well it fits together with ZFS, even if you may get a few percent more performance on a less reliable file system, uh, if you're comfortable risking your database. Hmm. But um, I do see a 2013 one, but anyway. So the downside is that if you uh, just rely on ZFS snapshots that basically Replaying the backup is equivalent to just having pkill nine all the uh, Postgres processes. So yes, you're atomically consistent. Your database will recover unless there is an unknown bug in Postgres, which nobody else has encountered, which is quite unlikely. Uh, but it does mean that it doesn't start up completely clean. But uh, yeah, so oh. It, a little more startup time maybe to apply the lock again, but works for my workloads and it's the easiest to just rely on ZFS snapshots and Naturally. Postgres being a correct transactional database. Okay, uh, other tips and tricks here, either specific to Postgres or other uses. Um, looking at what's up above, um, you know, if you're doing the PG start backup, taking the snapshot and then doing PG stop backup, that should leave you in a good state right there. And then I would say probably after the backup or after the, the start backup and stop backup, you actually do your, your transfer, be it with tar CPIO or a ZFS send. Um, I would strongly consider a, via, a ZFS send rather than using TAR or CPIO. Naturally, this is the docs okay. I found. But what's the performance impact of this? Does it stop it entirely or just slow it down it, or what? Uh, it prevents all in-place modifications so that the will think of it like the database level equivalent of uh, a pool-wide snapshot. A checkpoint? Yeah, kind of. So basically only newly allocated storage can be modified while this is in progress. And that means that while you will have uh, inconsistent additional data backup, uh, your backup will contain a consistent state of your database, which can easily be uh, restarted. And even if you use uh, traditional backup tools like... Uh, even simple tar, a ZFS snapshot is what you want to back up. Right. You don't <clears throat> have to back up the writable file system while this is running. Just take a snapshot of your 
data set containing the database and whatever yeah. else it contains, back up the snapshot. For that, I would recommend something like Vestic. And if you want to have a file system level instead of a ZFS snapshot level replication, and then you get the atomically consistent ZFS yep. view of the snapshot. And, and if you do have a separate wall, should you um, do I'm the, not do, would this apply to both of them at the use... same time? I'm not a Postgres person, obviously. Go ahead. So the, the writer head block and the uh, rest of the database tables have to be in sync. Mm -hmm. So you can't just run one ZFS snapshot and another. I'm not sure if at least at the right low level using ZFS channel programs, you could take an atomically consistent snapshots across multiple data sets. I think it's possible, but I don't know for sure. Certainly, I wouldn't know how to reliably create this uh, because I haven't seen any documentation how to do it. And it's documenting. Um, and I would specifically mention that you take the snapshot at four and then you do the send at six and then continue on with seven because so, the snapshot should be practically instantaneous. Correct. So oh, yes. the send obviously will not be and you don't want to tie up your system in that uh, backup yeah. mode. Exactly. Correct. What you would do is if you do the PG start uh, backup, you would run PG start backup, then take the snapshot or snapshots and using PG start backup, you don't have to have atomically consistent view of your individual um, uh, data sets. You could have two data sets take snapshot a few seconds apart if uh, if Postgres is in the PG uh, backup mode right now. And once you have taken all the snapshots, you can then stop the Postgres backup mode, letting your Postgres system run normally and yep. ZFS will take care of the copy on write semantics, allowing you to take your time to turn your local snapshot into a replicated backup using whatever tool you prefer. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. And does anyone have knowledge that will transfer over to MySQL MariaDB and friends? Um, I haven't that's... done MySQL, D MySQL or Miria since there was only MySQL. So <laughs> I've been using yeah. Postgres for quite some time at this point. Fair, understood. Uh, for SQLite, we're skipping ahead. Yep, please. Like SQLite, uh, at least in recent-ish versions, has a built-in uh, command dot backup in the shell. So that will take care of taking a read log on the database and writing it out to a new file. So uh, it just uses the database transaction logic to write a SQLite database from scratch, which will be compacted because it's the fresh database. So there was no time to build up fragmentation. And it's just exactly, you can use the backup API and the command line uh, SQLite free tool makes this API available to simple shell scripting. Um, what's nice about this is that it's normally expected that SQLite databases are so small relative to the size of the system comfortably running ZFS that each individual database can be backed up like this. But again, as long as your databases do, don't cross uh, data sets, you don't have to do anything fancy if you are comfortable relying on the crash recovery of your database. SQLite, Postgres, and unless it's completely broken and misconfigured, uh, MySQL as well will just come back up um, as expected if you roll back the data set. Hey, or have you? The... 
Go ahead. Have you seen any precautions such as separating out data sets like you would with the wall on Postgres, or it's pretty um, much good to go no, as is? It's not normally done. And it would be problematic because the there's no directory to use as mount point in between. Okay. So basically you have the database file, and then you have either, depending on your uh, journal mode in SQLite, you either have an undo or a write ahead log. Uh, so a database consists of a database itself and the log file. And if you use the slower mode, which can't have concurrent readers with a writer, uh, you have an undo log, which has the neat property of being de deleted when there is no open transaction. So that basically a closed database is a single file, which makes it uh, convenient to use as a document format which some applications do. Whereas if you use the faster write ahead logging mode, which allows more concurrency, where you can have multiple readers or one writer at the same time, then you can't just um, open up the um, single file. You have to keep both files if you move a document stored that way around. Okay. And you have to be able to uh, apply the write ahead log to get to a consistent state. So you have to have write access to the database uh, file you um, to basically get it into a consistent state because to recover from a crash, you apply the write ahead log and that can only be done if it's um, there instead of basically reading the existing file read only and looking the result, uh, the old state up in the undo log uh, on demand, which allows the older slower mode to work even if you, you have uh, only read permission. Mm -hmm. which is, for example, the FreeBSD package database, so that non-root users, which can't have write access, can still read the installed package list. Understood. Yeah. Go ahead, it's Andrew. Worth, it's worth noting that the the general rule for just about everything is going to be you want to uh, keep all of your stuff in the same hierarchy of file systems so that you can take that snapshot atomically. Um, uh, that does. That's not going to matter whether you're talking, yeah. you know, Mira, MySQL. Um, and because uh, it really CS doesn't matter. Let him finish. Go ahead. Okay. I was just going to say it really doesn't matter. That that rule is always going to be a preference. Yes, and in almost all cases, you can just say uh, ZFS will never expose application to torn writes. Uh, it will only always be a uh, automatically consistent view between two system calls. Uh, so this means that any reasonably designed data storage format will just work. And you don't have to do the normal um, song and dance format or database specific tricks to take a backup of a mutable file or directory. Mm -hmm. But you just take a snapshot and then you back up the snapshot and everything is expected to quickly and cleanly and reliably continue from the snapshot because it's no worse than a hard reboot, a panic, a power loss. So if you can't recover automatically from that, then you are just a special snowflake requiring manual attention. And in all the other cases, ZFS takes care of your uh, data quiescence. It's also probably worth noting that we're only really discussing from the, from the database, from the databases perspective down. We're not talking about the data within the database. So it should probably be noted that people need to make sure their database transactions are atomic within the database. Otherwise, 
within the database, you could end up with a half committed transaction. Well, in which case, the, the, not the, really the database the half well one wouldn't be persisted. Sure, sure, it would if if not if not done correctly. What I'm getting okay. at. Let him finish. What I'm, what I'm getting at is that if you're not properly putting it in an in an atomic action, whatever you're doing above the database, and so you end up with you're doing something on two or three tables and you're not doing it as a single operation, you get halfway through it, the the um, the, the, the restore's done, and now you've got it half uncompleted. But from the database's perspective, it doesn't know that you intended to commit part of it. So that's you need to fix your scheme. You know, that's you need to fix your database usage yeah, and design. Yeah, exactly. That's not file system. Or it's not our problem. System. It's not our problem. Exactly. Nicely put. This is, um, you have to be this large to uh, write. Yeah, it's it's okay. not our problem, but it's something we should, you know, we should probably explicitly tell people we are not responsible for this, you are. We are not magic. <laughs> yeah. Even if it feels that way sometimes. Surprisingly, I couldn't find a word about Oracle databases despite them open owning Solaris and technically their own ZFS. Um, if you're happy to segue into other applications, great. Else, if you think generally they're fine. But I do know that, say, backup applications and Hyper-V have uh, great acrobatics for flushing out and using, say, the internals of shadow copies and such, and resilient change tracking to keep things consistent. Uh, if you have any thoughts at this time, great. If not, we can move on. Yes, I do have one more question that is uh, using ZFS on Linux and QEMO, um, is there any integration to use ZFS snapshotting and replication for live migration? I do not have an answer for that, but uh, let's explore that. So you're thinking, well, we know about the uh, occasional hostility of that community towards OpenZFS, but you think that QEMU could have a ZFS native snap snapshot infrastructure? Um, let's say I have two virtual machine hosts, and they're basically the active system and the standby system, and I keep on... Um, Asynchronously in the background, replicating the Z vaults or just data sets containing raw images of uh, virtual machines um, using ZFS replication. Yep. And if I then want to migrate a virtual machine over, I don't have to do a full replication of its block storage. I have to put the block storage uh, on some kind of uh, storage area network to just access the iSCSI or whatever, or images on an NFS mount. Instead, I could just do my best to basically keep a replica on the system close by. And then when I want to migrate, I only have to do the incremental send and, and I, I trust you mean live it. migration in so far as you could just send I it over? Basically Go ahead. hold the guest, do a new snapshot, and that one would be very small because it's only the time while you can actually do this a few times over in the hope that the window always gets smaller until you have a very short yep. window where you do the last bit with right stopped, move it over, and then you can use the data set on the replicated standby system to have very low live migration so that you don't have to have a 100 gig pipe between your systems. And key point, live migration, because if you're in a ZFS environment, you, you're probably already well aware of getting everything over in the state you desire and doing a manual cutover. I'm and looking at the QEMU migration docs. Yeah. 
I mean, there could be other workarounds. For example, you could use basically a rate one between a local and a network block device. You can do something similar with HSD and FreeBSD. Um, yeah. You may be in theory <laughs> able to use uh, a Lua over iSCSI to have two paths and then always look at your even your local storage as if it was an iSCSI. But yeah. I'd be curious if QCOW2 snapshots could transparently be ZFS snapshots under the hood, just like they're doing VMware snapshots that get do a do, do a dance and you, and result in a ZFS snapshot on certain storage platforms. It would be nice to have a way to basically import and export uh, a data set with its file system, uh, sorry, with its snapshots, mm -hmm. so that you can basically write out some the latest state and some uh, snapshots like basically take an incremental stream and reinterpret it into a at least of a Z, single Z wall and reinterpret it into a Q code 2 file and the other way around as well take a Q code 2 file and produce a equivalent um, replication stream okay. that would be a way to do it without having to it would be a filter in your import export process, which you would just pipe it through. Does anyone have a horror story where a virtual machine did not come back because despite being on ZFS, it was snapshotted at an inconsistent state? I've traditionally heard, well, all the Linux machines came back, but not the Windows ones. Yeah, <laughs> but that's just. If you reboot Windows on physical hardware while it's upgrading itself, yes, this is true. <laughs> it, ZFS is not magic. Yeah, it I want to protect say, bad applications from themselves. I I, I want to say I, I I have had issues with this come up, but it's it's the same thing as if you walk up and push the power button. Yep. You know, you don't expect a perfect response. Because I want to say I, I one or two times had to go back, not to the last snapshot, but to one of the previous ones. So I have a horror story along the lines of you can't protect the system from itself, the file system, in this case, that if it's innocent, but someone using the uh, Fusion IO cards back when we were new, and ZFS on Linux when it was a lot more experimental, but it was innocent. And it turned out the problem was that the version they're upgrading their CentOS between, or was it ZFS? Could be a Debian based system anyway. Um, the problem was that System D used um, libi notify in the init process to monitor certain files for modifications and the system was so fast at applying the system update to upgrade between releases that um, the queue of modified files in the kernel overflowed because system D didn't uh, drain the queue. And in this case, what I notify in the Linux kernel does is just tell you, well, the queue overflowed, time to rescan and system D copy and pasted the example code from lib uh, I notify, which just aborted the process in this case. So they just aborted the init process and panicked the kernel because the local storage was too fast. Not, Why? Yeah, because <laughs> Sorry. the kernel has a 50 element deep queue depth. And if you run your loaded system and it overflows because uh, Pit one doesn't get scheduled before the queue overflows. It just copy and pasted example code from my first lib I notify application, basically. And yeah, but that's just a ridiculous design flaw in an init system. And there's nothing VFS can do, but that's how a system can basically kernel panic during an update, and you get a mix of this kernel, the old modules, and uh, but the new kernel, and it doesn't boot. Yeah. Fascinating. But that's, 
again, this would have happened with any other uh, su sufficiently fast file system yep. and local storage and this collection of user space software on top of it. I'd like to return to the story of Windows uh, not rebooting uh, just in case of VM been stopped. Uh, I It comes to memory that VMware agent uh, supposed to have integration like that. So when you create VMware snapshots, it tells VMware tells to the agent inside the VM to flush all file system caches and do things like that and freeze file system for a second until VMware creates a snapshot. In Trunas, we have integration for that to create Trunas snapshot at exactly the same time. But I just mm -hmm. wonder, uh, is it something like our other VMs may have similar functionality in their agents or how widespread is that? That um, would be the, the proper way to do things. Yeah, it's certainly something that can be done. Uh, VMware did it. Um, um, but you have to have an agent. I believe you have to have an agent in Windows in order to facilitate it. No, yeah, that obviously looks... it's uh, it's always specific, but that's the only way to make it more or less reliable. Doesn't QEMO also support basically the opposite direction where the guest requests to be snapshotted over the uh, guest agent? You could do it either way. That... So we can say snapshot me, I'm ready. No, basically you could have your automation request from inside the guest that the hypervisor and its storage backend, whether QCO2 or ZFS or whatever you're using, take a snapshot of the block devices of this guest. Maybe you can even specify when I'm not familiar with the low level details. Basically, Snapshot me now, I'm about to do something important and risky, like updating the operating system to the next major release or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's exactly what I'm discussing here. I mean, wh while you can certainly do it either direction, it certainly... I certainly don't like the idea of my guest OSs telling things unbidden to the global zone because well, that's assuming that they're talking to the global zone and not a zone dedicated to them sure i mean in either case this 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 talking outside of your little box mm -hmm. and telling something purpose. outside <laughs> of your your little box is something that i don't particularly like even if that's a little box you have all to yourself and you could have a hostile VM or jail or zone that simply says, you know, snapshot me, snapshot me, snapshot me as a exactly. yeah, that's my tell boss. Them, uh, after 10 or so snapshots, uh, quota exceeded. Um, well, fair enough. But I mean, so yeah, you, I think you, the only way to get it race free is to make sure that because the, either you have to do it in a sequence with an outside orchestration tool, let's say Ansible. Um, or you have to put the virtual machine itself in control, allowing it to be, tell its hypervisor what is required when basically take a snapshot before the upgrade, reboot after the upgrade, to take a new snapshot, and then basically similar to how you would use boot environments. So a bit like databases, you get your getting hygiene right. Go ahead. You folks are getting really close to actually what, what I do on a number of systems. So when I hand a VM over to an R&D person, for instance, um, there's actually a tool they can run that says snapshot this system. And yes, I do run with a quota of 10 um, in case there's a bug in their code. They can only use 10. I basically have a small VM running a database off to the side. The tool contacts the database. The, the database looks up to find out who it is. Um, so if I can't determine who you are, it won't work. You don't get to tell me who you are, if that makes any sense. It makes um, a lot of sense. And at that point, you can do two types of snapshots. Um, one is a live snapshot. So this, the system does not come down. It just has the underpin, the underlying storage is snapshotted. Um, or you can have a snapshot made where I, the, the, that, the, the, the support VM will actually take the system down snapshot it and bring it back up. 
And this is also linked in with Cloud Init so that developers can request a snapshot, install a new Cloud Init file, and then request their system be snapshotted and brought back online, at which point their new their new Cloud Init code executes. But your, your your discussion, I thought that was worth noting that your discussion point is very similar to what I ended up doing, and it, it turned it ended up being this way due to a, the set of requirements to allow the devs to be able to do what they do. Do you have example? any just points on the heavy lifting for the live snapshot? Are you doing just like sync, 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 or some some What's fancier VM level? Um, so, the answer, so the answer there is no. It is up to the developer that owns the VM to make sure that the system is ready to be snapshotted. If they create a completely useless snapshot, Not then they create a completely useless snapshot. Um, I've I've spent way too much time trying to determine why something was wrong. It's like, guys, you, you need to take responsibility for this on your side. Exactly. You can only lead them to water. You can't force them to drink. Yeah. You know, if they want to shut down their, whatever database they're using, yeah. you know, for instance, if they want to shut that down and then pull a snapshot or do an update or what have you, I, you know, it's, they're the ones who need to architect that piece of the code. Yeah, and I thank you for those links on QMU Snapshot because they've certainly got some history on this. I'll just drop them in there for now. Okay, appreciated. And uh, John, what operating, what guest operating systems are you talking? Mostly Linux or? Uh, 99% of what you just heard is the guest OS is, is a Linux Linux variant. Okay. You know, it, you know, RHEL or, okay. or Fedora or, or Ubuntu or whatever. And you're using Beehive as hypervisor or what are you using? Um, I actually use both QEMU and Beehive as hypervisors. And I believe I had commented previously, I'm about 50-50 right now. Are you using the QEMO agent interface for this? I am not. Or are you using your own command? Our, I'm using our own configuration. Interesting. Does Is anyone familiar with the QEMU agent on, say, FreeBSD and Lumos? What it, I know yeah, is it up to speed with? For it. I've tried to play with it in uh, QEMO virtualized environment and I haven't done much with it. I just know So that if you're familiar with QEMU, you can generate um, Chardev, CareDev devices. Mm -hmm. And I have played around with generating a, a device within the, the VM, which basically looks like a serial port. You can then attach that serial port to an outside process internal to the VM, you can then watch that serial, that port, and, you know, you can put some form of a state machine in place, yada, yada, yada. But so, that, the support for that ends up being relatively, for me, it was relatively high. So, uh, if I remember correctly, it's done using a VidIO console device. That uh, console yes. Can well, specify can, yes, I agree. And there's a well-known port name for the agent connection. The advantage of using a serial port is while it's slow, uh, it doesn't require um, any kind of configuration, unlike an additional Ethernet port, where you would have to assign an IP address and so on, which is why the guest agent to host interaction is normally done over either a dedicated power virtualized device or reusing the simplest one possible which is a serial port emulation of a kind yes do we have a way to to do the serial port like that in a beehive uh we Even have we're kind of off topic i figured we that, have, like uh, the nmdm ports or what or exactly else. um so you can either um tell the agent to speak to a Special port, you could make one of the up to four uh, COM ports, emulated serial ports available and just tell it to use it or put the a sim link into the device file system to make them appear at this uh, port. Or you could use the 
uh, existing VIRT.io uh, console and configure it as to uh, appear like uh, the agent expects it to look like. Um, but then I don't think you can't use an NMDM device in FreeBSD, but you have to use a Unix socket, which works as well. So oh, if I can use a Unix socket, then a Unix the host, socket definitely um, will work for me. Or yeah. anything I'd want to do. A Unix socket would definitely work for anything I would want to do. Exactly. So basically, the Beehive becomes a Unix socket uh, server and it allows a single connection at a time to the socket. And your host side of the agent would just connect to that, uh, reconnect when Beehive restarts. Using what device model? So the, the AO console. console. Okay. Uh, so hmm. check the BSD Beehive main page for console. Hmm. Uh, let me check the exact syntax. Red IO console, there it is. Yep. It's simply. Uh, yeah, and you can just. Okay, it's path name slash path to a socket. And you can have up to 16 ports per instance. There it is. Okay, great. Thank uh, you. And that. Beehive does not clean up the sockets itself, so that has to be done with the script handling the exit status and so on. Okay, I'll do some more looking and see if um, the Illumo side of it has a similar thing, but it probably does. I think the, at least one of the uh, Beehive Illumos ports does support VIO console. I'll spend some time looking at it. What's nice about re-implementing the Beehive, uh, sorry, the QEMO protocol is that existing agents mm, for guests are there and people are familiar with them, at least some are. The downside is that you have to support someone else's protocol, but the protocol is just, I think, one JSON object per line over a serial interface or something like that. So it's a really flexible, extensible, and not too complex protocol. I mean, I'm more interested in using a generic serial port than an actual console. So um, when, finding something else to it. That's the way I went. And the the secondary issue that I've run into is also what I call the TMUX conundrum, which is um, I have many hypervisors and I'd eventually like to join them back up to a central server. So then I've started playing all kinds of games with SOCAT to try to tunnel the uh, the, the the local socket or whatever entity it is that we're mm -hmm. dealing with back to that central location and have it all work correctly so and, and for, still be secure. For security purposes, what you can do is at, in FreeBSD, I don't know how to do it in Illumos, but I'm pretty sure zones can be used similarly, is to um, take advantage of the fact that the connection, the client wanting to talk to the console establishes is a file descriptor. So you, what you can do is have for example, in FreeBSD, uh, SSH configured to use the PAM um, jail module to basically derive the jail to be uh, attached to from the home directory path where you basically split the path up using a slash dot slash in the path, which is a knob in a path but it's a marker to split the jail route from the home directory in the jail. And then uh, you can look up the jail by root directory, which has to be unique and attach to the jail. And the neat hack is for security purposes, very neat is that the jail can be configured to have neither IPv4 nor IPv6 enabled. Right, would that apply to a VM in any way? As John's doing. No, this is so that uh, the. You, yeah, I'm thinking. I'm thinking about it. Think about multi-tenancy here. You have your operator setting this up, and you're providing the virtual machine for someone else. And to connect to the virtual machine on the hypervisor outside of their virtual machine, 
you don't want them to uh, escalate this privilege to gain access to someone else's virtual machines uh, console. Exactly. Yes, exactly. I trust me with you. <laughs> and you can have basically one uh, very thin minimal jail with only PicoCom inside of it. Um, or if you want to do it with base system towards CU or something, and um, you then use a force command in SSH to force them as this user, which doesn't, which isn't privileged anymore, to just basically drop into this uh, uh, jail, uh, drop the privileges, and then do this and this. And because they J attached to a persistent jail, you can also set the basically using resource limits, uh, you can set the number of forks, so basically how many processes can they fork inside the jail to zero so that they can't even fork a child process inside the jail. And then you have a jail with, let's say, PicoCom and nothing else. Uh, so libc and what does PicoCom use? Uh, so you have libc, the runtime linker, and that's it. Not even a shell, nothing in there, because you use a force command, you for and that just does it. So that even if they get execution in there, it's a very uninteresting, extremely restrictive sandbox, because even at a system call level, the they can't even create an IPv4 or an IPv6 socket. Um, there is no path for them to attack any uh, Unix sockets they could exploit because there's nothing listening inside the file system they can view if they get code execution in there. And so, beyond, what about the file system to bring it home to ZFS? Uh, which file system to bring it home to ZFS? This is about just to bring allowing... it home as a topic on this call. Yeah, uh, okay. Uh, the You would use uh, read-only... Uh, so you take, create the, this very minimal container environment mm -hmm. with only the tool opening the uh, NMDM device, for example. <coughs> if you use for that, you would use PicoCom or SoCat for uh, yep. Unix sockets, and that's it. Cool. Um, uh, I would love to see some proof of the concept of that, and uh, let's keep it on ZFS topics. Mm -hmm. Anything else um, on quiescing? I am curious if, Alexander, you worked on the VMware snapshot code. There was a great blog post where somebody untangled what it's doing, I think with like free NAS9, but I'll try to find that link. But they went through all the steps of what's going on under the hood, so I don't know if there are lessons there for this this narrative uh I'll try to find oh, it. commands to request uh snapshots on loans via iSCSI it was yeah the VAAI work what are it, doing? it says hey VMware snapshot then yeah we'll do our snapshot and then free it up or something like that let me try to find this so, anyhow if someone's done the hard work for those exact moments at the be it VMware or Windows command line, let's uh, extract that because happy often, to steal. Yeah, happy <laughs> to steal exactly. Yeah, but uh, uh, this would be at the come target layer level if you you're exporting uh, Z vaults or files as iSCSI targets, and then hmm. it would be basically requesting a snapshot and. Exposing snapshot management via SCSI commands. So I know there are host side copy commands <clears throat> which uh, have been implemented. I'd often do that. We only did uh, in Trunas like simple approach when Trunas wish to create next snapshot, it connects to VMware. I don't remember the, the center or specific host and request it to create snapshot 
and while it creates snapshot, Trunas also creates snapshot that way. Opposite way, uh, like making VMware to ask uh, NAS to create snapshot would require implementation of VWALs. It's a different, completely different uh, thing in VMware with extremely rich API that I don't know anybody in open source implemented. Ah, interesting. And I don't so, know how much publicly available documentation it is for that. Um, I, I would say certainly... close to zero, even without I publicly. We tried, tried to contact was unable to. Oh, one at a time. Uh, in order, it was Alexander and Andrew and John. Go ahead. We tried to investigate it, but didn't went uh, very far in conversation to VMware. They're too much closed company to get anything out of them. So we gave up on that. Even so, it would be really nice to see it integrated with ZFS because it does exactly what ZFS can do. It can do snapshots, it can do clones, it can do all those things. Uh, it would perfectly match with ZFS, but uh, it would require writing some Java plugins for VMware uh, without having documentation, ability to test, and just so much pain that so far, at least we haven't got that way. It's certainly Just, something uh, I would love to see because the reality is ZFS does all of the snapshot and cloning and all of that much better than ESXi does. Correct. Um, and well, John had a comment, Jan, just one sec. John, were you interjecting about uh, the well, proprietary a, a, docs? A two-part comment. One, Please. I wanted to thank Alexander for all his work on the... Uh, CTL process for being able to work on some of the the VVOL uh, sub parts that allow that to work as well as it does. Um, I have a number of uh, VMware systems using uh, FreeBSD CTL as their storage back end. Um, I have also tried to contact VMware to try to get more information about uh, uh, having a, a complete VVOL implementation. And the, the, my, the response is typically silence. It is at, at, best, at best, it's closed source. And thank you for bumping up the SCSI tag size passed through uh, in CTL to the full 64 bit and passing it through to the whole, the whole stack so that you can have the nice things. Yeah, we had some conversations about identifying exactly what's going wrong there. Let's see. I think we have a crisis here. Let's see. Um, we are at about an hour and 20 minutes, approaching a moot's jaw of an hour and a half. Anything else? We've covered a lot of good ground. Is um, it known which, uh, how, if they support? Snapshot management via SCSI commands, VMware does it. Which commands they're using? Has someone reverse engineered this? Is there even some documentation on it? So, basically, from what I've seen from some of the commercial products, it looks like they somehow do, but I haven't seen any reverse engineering done on it. And I certainly haven't, I, I don't have any of those commercial products at my disposal to look at it. Would they be traced at a protocol level or execution level? <laughs> How's that detrace for VMware coming? Go ahead. There are obviously some uh, functionality on SCSI level, such as support uh, for, mm -hmm. I forgot what terms of special LANs that could be mapped and mapped, because uh, all the VWAL concepts create so much LANs that any uh, SCSI target initiator going crazy otherwise. Uh, what you that, could do is finish. run such a product uh, with an unencrypted uh, iSCSI connection, capture all the packets on the network and look at it in Wireshark, which can at least give you access to the CCBs and so on. Yeah, but I, I suspect that the, like aside of few parts like mentioned, uh, uh, LAN management, most of other things must go out of band. They likely not even SCSI commands or maybe some proprietary commands. Exactly. Because the wall interface is not like SCSI interface. It's uh, you require to write plugin for VMware site on Java. Oh, okay. So it's uh, uh, it may be finish. mapped in, in, into SCSI later, but not like it's not standard things like it's uh, VAI, which just plain SCSI 
like Scorpion things. Yeah. I yes, had hoped we, that they just AI, use well, some kind of reverse command uh, opcode well, range. Yeah. I believe it's VVAI. VAI. Oh, VAI, v okay. Sorry. And is that documented in any way publicly or purely for a fee? Oh. VI completely documented in SCSI specification. It's just set of commands such as extended copy, uh, write same, and uh, report LBA status, and a uh, few more. It's nothing fancy, just okay. proper use of SCSI. Same time, VWALS require, like, it's not specified in SCSI aside of support for those fancy LAN and some commands like map LAN and map LAN. Uh, all the operations related to snapshots, they are not in SCSI specs, it's out of band. But even if, uh, let's say, FreeBSD using CTL were to come up with a solution, uh, most guest operating systems allow you to inject SCSI commands from user space so that you wouldn't have to write a kernel module to make use of this. You could write your own agent in some scripting language and just for example, on FreeBSD, uh, use chem control to inject the SCSI command in hex and get the reply back as hex. So that we could do this just. Uh... Yeah, I was at some point thinking about uh, adding that uh, LAN uh, command support, but never got yeah. much forward because without other parts, it makes no sense. Yeah. The question is, would the snapshots become new read-only LANs to be discovered? Uh, or And how would you handle something like a rollback? Uh, would you enable just then to basically redirect this existing LAN to some, and especially if you also support cloning? <laughs> basically tell me, this... Uh, we map this existing LAN's content and just talk to this ZFS clone or uh, volume now. And redirect this at as long as it's the same size, it would kind of work transparently for SCSI. <laughs> well, as I told, there are several uh, new SCSI commands uh, like maplan, maplan, and in yeah. that case, initiator can request please all. List, list all the child lands mm -hmm. of this LAN and it gets yeah. listed with some UUIDs that are stored in the initiator site. So VMware knows the list yeah. of all the snapshots. It can then request, please map this snapshot with UUID X into new LAN. Yeah. And then the respectively you target probably does that. use some node pages, right? To expose even more information. No, that's, it's, that, that interface is completely documented in SCSI specs. That's not a problem. It could be implemented. The problem so is that other parts finish. of that mm -hmm. other parts of actual snapshot management, like how to create snapshot, how to delete snapshot, those mm -hmm. are not specified in SCSI. Exactly. And I was hoping that VMware had just done it in house, but uh, you say they just uh, provide a way to write this proprietary plugin to big vendors. Yep. in their control plane instead of <laughs> and they have very very weird business model you must pay them a certain amount of money before they even start talking to you or providing yeah. any docs and they're currently uh squeezing their customers dry while it lasts so that's why we look at and support open source alternatives uh does anyone have topic ideas for future calls that have been building in the back of your head that I can drop in here? Well, let's start. Again, so Go ahead, Andrew. Andrew. I was going to say, it's kind of tangentially related. Bring it on. But um, I recently was mucking about with a local install of Ubuntu, and since I was doing an install, I'm like, okay, well, we'll hit the ZFS install option just to see what happens. And uh, some of their uh, choices I have questions about. Take care, most, John. Okay. Most notably, it seems they take the disk, partition it, 
and then make multiple pools on it. Yep. For some they reason. have two pools, a boot pool, and Proxmox does not do that. And for what it's worth, here's a dirty little secret. The Proxmox backup server is a smaller version of Proxmox that you can install, delete the PVE packages, and you have a pretty decent Debian-based root on ZFS system. I mean, ultimately, I was running it in a VM anyway, so it doesn't yeah, fair enough. really matter. I just ended up, I just blew it away and, and did a non-install because it's in a VM, and I'm not getting any benefits from ZFS on that thing anyway. Okay. It's, it's, it's just a built environment for an experiment I was doing. Fair enough. But uh, so, is the broader question just good root on the, CFS the, experiences in Linux? I think the bro I think the broader question is, um, should we be bringing to their attention that maybe they should be doing this a better way? Good luck. <laughs> yes, well, and they did have a fancy tool that managed ZFS in several ways, but apparently it was on again, off again, on again, and we shall see what's going on for the latest release. Other topics. Well, uh, documenting existing ways of getting around uh, the basically um, inertia of large pools, how to handle fast recovery Things like uh, build your storage out you like talking? this. So, um, things like okay, if you have a J board with two upstream ports hooked to two servers, you can have an active passive or active standby the M situation where you don't have to wait for tens or hundreds or even more of terabytes to copy over. But instead, you basically redefine who is in charge of the disks because at scale, storage has really has inertia. You can't just wish a few terabytes over. Very correct. Uh, were you on the and, call when we discussed the risks where I think I forgot, I'd have to look up his name, but maybe it was Jesse said, hey, uh, the safety belts, we're not helping him. Um, yes, it's the host it ID commands. Okay, great. So that's related that's, to it, but let's just yes. kind of keep building on that topic. And regarding virtualization, I think it would be useful to document a virtual equivalent to what you would build out for experimentation and learning as well as for running regression tests uh so best practices for development environments or test environments Basically, uh, oh john come back <laughs> he does a lot um, of that um not just the development environment, basically um agreed upon way of how this should look so for example that you could set up your development pipeline to run these non-trivial storage setups virtualized so yeah. that you can run it as a affordable pipeline, but equivalent to what could be built using such um, J boards or even uh, switches or historically using fiber channel or on a bu shoestring budget using iSCSI. Yeah, you can accept the trade-offs. And am I hearing something about having consistent, perhaps reference machines and configurations that various people can test? Like if there's a new version of two three is coming, please spin up at least this exact machine, test there, and, and then broaden uh, to also your to, unique, uh, unicorn installation. The other part, which is would be more like developing this and improving the documentation of this is how you're supposed to set it up so that there is a correct way which and not the works 95% of the time and in the rest of the cases uh, I sure hope the pool wasn't important. Okay. Kind of thing. Where, for example, the host ID problem, but also just things uh, guidance on how to 
do this and or just gotchas like for example that most disk firmwares really don't like round robin writes uh, over two paths so that you are better off uh, not using active active multipathing because that means that you're basically sending your writes uh, as two streams which is non-optimal and at least uh, Seagate and Toshiba hard disks which then just lose like half their throughput if they are written sequentially but over two ports instead of one via a single uh, expander. Got it. Uh, Alexander, as a developer, is there something that would be helpful from the community or project that would be like here's our standard reference reference implementation or VM or something that would make your life easier. I'm sorry, I missed it. Uh, reference for doing what? Oh, Jan and I touched on like reference virtual machines or configurations. Is there anything that the, the so upstream project or community could produce that would be useful to you as a developer where it's a, a standardized starting place be it installation, be it configuration or otherwise. Of course, your organization course. has rather established procedures, but just curious what might be helpful out here. So the reason I bring this up and virtualizing this is that yeah. otherwise uh, you're talking about like 12 uh, rack units for your lab just for JBots and then two servers or something like this, because you want to have three dual ported jaybirds to have your triple mirrored not completely no single point of failure pool to fail over between and then you need a third node to form a chrome for your control plane and suddenly you have a two kilowatt lab environment right 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 and expensive and you then exactly and you have to afford the lab but just to reproduce the cases uh, you could probably use a modern laptop okay uh, so alexander is there anything we could do on the outside to make your life easier as a developer well, if we are speaking about like uh for a lower time pulling part time uh, or just testing it uh, CTL can actually do dual porting with reservation, and that's how we are testing uh, basic uh, like failover things in TrueNAS. If that's yeah. what about otherwise, uh, I, I'm still not sure what what the request like of all the facts about that dual porting disks are not happy about dual port access. That's we know about that. That's why we are trying to use white porting instead of multi passing. It doesn't have those problems, but so it won't help if using? you wide porting. Wide porting. Oh but yeah, of, co need, of course. If it's if it's not enough bandwidth of single, yeah, uh, you, single you cable to, to one uh, controller. So if you have two paths to the same HPA, it's just a wider link. No, well, yeah, uh, just some people tend to connect it wrong, and Trunas actually supported multipass for a while, but yeah. then we decided to drop it. It creates more problems than, than solves. So, uh, this is FreeBSD, uh, GEOM specific, but yeah, GEOM multipath is. That's a different topic. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, everyone, we're at an hour and 40 minutes. Anything else to discuss this week or shall we meet in two weeks possibly? Oh, Alexander, question for you specifically. Would Wednesdays at say two or three Pacific, which would be two, three, four, five or six Eastern work for you to not conflict with a meeting? Uh, what's that so in UTC? That's for Alexander. Oh, good question. Uh, I can look that up. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, Wednesday should work for me. Okay, cool. Uh, world time, buddy, let's take a look. So if that were to be, say, 2 p.m. would be, oh, 9 p.m. UTC. So a bit late, but not too crazy, Jan. 9 p.m. UTC? Oh, uh, yes. Okay. Uh, I was thinking a Wednesday is better than a Friday because asking people to meet Friday at 9 p.m. might not yeah. go very smoothly. 
that's yeah that's 11 p.m local for me oh oh you're not utc of course okay yeah. <laughs> uh, i could maybe push that to an hour earlier would an yeah, hour earlier would help but okay let me see what that works out to so 1 p.m uh what's Jan? oh you're in berlin i knew that so let me put that in there utc plus two okay so if we were to do 1 p.m that would be 8 p.m utc 10 p.m berlin yeah that's no problem and if we were to kick in our dear friends in australia let's see oh well they have several time zones to play with yeah, but i think yeah uh it's still early morning so yeah that's that remains a tough time zone <laughs> There is no perfect uh, meeting time, but I'll, I'll we can experiment with moving this around. Okay. Any final thoughts or questions or ideas? Um, the thought of, uh, about moving it. Yeah. Um, I know that I'm not a huge. I don't have huge objections to moving it. Yeah. But I know that for me, having it in the alternate slot for the Beehive meeting. Uh, ends up making it very easy for me to make both. I understand completely. I'm in a similar situation. So yeah. having multiple meetings per week uh, will always be a challenge. But uh, let's... Not just per week, but per day. Correct. Uh, let me emphasize that if you get your ideas documented, uh, hopefully they will get the attention of others, and then you can at your leisure show up and read the notes or watch the video and hopefully get exactly what you are after. So I don't want this to be a stressful meeting. Everyone has enough meetings already. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I would like to call it and talk to some of you next Wednesday. Anything else, Andrew? What's Wednesday? Uh, there's a jail call for those who oh. celebrate. Who <laughs> celebrate jails? <laughs> exactly, okay. I know. Uh, it is 18.42 uh, UTC. Anyway, I will be around a few minutes. Thank you, everyone, very, very much for this. We've gone into some great depth. And thank you, Alexander, for your wisdom. And again, those CTL fixes that we are all benefiting from. Thank you.